the four girls on the Asian will bring the revolution. And the revolution sounds like a soldier. You are a foot soldier. Well, I was, I was a foot soldier in the first the Asian Green Revolution. Uh, in, in the late 60s, I was uh, a postgraduate student um, at Cornell at the International Rights Research Institute. And I saw the Green Revolution developed by individuals. Norman Borlaug, Edmund Swami Evan, uh, Robert Chandler, many people like that. And, uh, and realized each other, despite passing, has my time up. So one of the things Secretary General Coffey Man also did was ask, developed the UN Millennium Project uh, to put out exactly what the, what, how the Millennium Development Goals would be achieved. In and I was honored to chair, co-chair, uh, the UN Millennium Project uh, Task Force on Hunger. Professor Ms. Nasser from India, Akin, was a member of this panel, and several discussions with the Secretary General, along with the, uh, the <coughs> Academy uh, people, led to the idea to go a uniquely African Green Revolution. When the Secretary General makes a call, people listen. And sometime before July 2004, Secretary General made a call in this series about AIDS, the world did. In July 5th, 2004, at the old uh, African Union meeting, Secretary General made a call for a uniquely African Green Revolution. And I think that thing about 10 years ago is something we should celebrate. The, the, uh, the 10th, the 10th year, of that call. And he said we need a, a green revolution, green revolution for Africa, not only to pay attention to increasing uh, production, paying attention to soils, water, seeds, but also to pay attention to human nutrition, to reduce the rate of stunting in children, uh, to have uh, <coughs> pregnant and, and, uh, and nursing uh, women uh, properly uh, nourished, so nutrition came in. Then another part is uh, to make markets work for the poor. Markets don't work for the poor by themselves, and that market creation. And then when he went on to say, and all of this has to be done in environmentally sustainable ways and supported by appropriate policies. This was a green revolution. He launched it almost a little bit over 10 years ago in Addis Ababa, and it has changed the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we are all here tonight to, uh, we are having a great dinner, but there is another reason, which is malnutrition. The fact of the matter is that we have 240 million people in Africa today that we know the best country. We have about 26% of those that are malnourished children in the world there in Africa. And so what we are really having is that we are shaping up the GDP growth because of something. And so the gray matter infrastructure, we are building gray infrastructure, but we are not building uh, gray matter infrastructure. So Mr. Anand, you're the one that started this uh, MPG. And nutrition is not so critical. And it's not even there in the gray revolution at all. So my question is, uh, what is, why is the nutrition not there? Is there a competitive for you to do that? And how should we proceed to make sure You can't hear? I'll say. It wasn't me, it was a sister. It's to uh, reduce uh, poverty.
مثلا افراد این این بنیانی
and you indicated, I think you said it and somebody else said it, that you can hate GDP. We get so enamored with statistics that we forget we need the real human beings. And, and I think now that people realize that not only you can increase productivity, but you can also make life meaningful for people. And almost every leader today in Africa talks about looking for investments in agriculture. And yet, for 20 years, we all abandoned agriculture, including the world. But today we are back. And I think if we sustain the settlement, we will have a real impact and we will succeed in our dream. And the dream that has to be much bigger than we Africans tend to do. Dream small, but here I think we need to hold, we need to say we need to feed ourselves and we want to help feed the world. And we can do it. I don't know if you can or you can accept that. But, but, I mean, not exactly what I want to hear it a bit louder because uh, <laughs> what he said is that we have to think big and that in Africa we always dream. I think, we don't, we don't think as big. And let me paint the picture of thinking big that Mr. Lambert's told us. The world is going to have a population of 9 million people by 2050. Well, 65% of the land sir, to feed that world is not in Asia, it's not in Latin America, it's right here in Africa. So what we do in Africa's land, what we do in Africa's agriculture, will determine what happens to the 7 and 9 million people in the world. So the challenge Mr. Nana has told to us tonight is that there are two parts of the bar, the lower end of the bar, we've got to be self-sufficient. But the upper end of the bar is that Africa must become a global powerhouse in food. Put your hands together, that's a great thing. Careful. Mr. Nana has just set a higher bar. Now how can we sustain the kind of revolution that we're having now? And how can we even work at real scale to meet the kind of challenge just true to us? There? Because even in Africa, our population will rise to 2.6 billion by 2050. And crop production has to be terms of productivity was rise by 260 percent. So we need science. So what must we do to achieve that? <clears throat> okay. Um, right now, or two years ago, Africa's average yields were about one ton per hectare of maize for the equivalent in other crops. While India had three tons, Latin America three tons, China five <coughs> tons, South Africa five tons, and the US, Europe, uh, Japan ten tons. So the thing is, how do we go from one, three, and five, and ten? It's perfectly possible. And, and many of the farmers in many villages are actually getting ten tons on their own. So it's not that this is a exclusively something from the first world that happens here. So we need we need science. And the first sign the first thing we need to do is to have there two there like two legs. My left leg is high value seeds that, that produce a lot of a lot of yield. Second leg is to feed the soil with fertilizers or organics. And both of them, then we can walk and run. But if we're only doing one, we're just going to have to get any. One of the, uh, science is absolutely necessary. Uh, science, especially as we grow towards five tons per hectare, uh, we believe it. Uh, it's tremendous work that plant breeders are doing here in Niagara under the leadership of Joe DeVries. It's, it's absolutely essential and very exciting. We have to do more technified parts. And, and for example, we we have a problem that we cannot send soil samples to laboratories in Africa and come back quick. And we need to do that in order to get that right way, right. So now there's a technique baptized by uh, the Honorable Minister, Paul Soldov, that does that and, and allows young people that are, that are totally hung up on their iPhones and so on, we're driving a taxi. Uh, instead of using their postgraduate degrees or universities, they can use 
web now, and, and the web and fertilizers and other things like that uh, can be stopped. This, this, is, this, is, this is happening. Science-based agriculture is, is the thing, and it's going on. So, so for that to happen, we have to really fund research. I think one of the, some of the great programs going on in Agra that have been supported, uh, there are probably four links. You know, so, oh, so, 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 so we have the seed, and I think we have soil fertility, you have markets, and policy. Those, right. those are the things, and I think they are all great things uh, uh, to have. Mr. Anand, you have always been outspoken about accountability. As Secretary of the United Nations, you have everybody speaking for it. In fact, many of us used to turn on our television and see how you, how you handle things that you should be accountable. Malabo Declaration on African Agriculture has set new targets for us. You are the person that has the moral leadership to tell us a lot of home truths. How do you think we can hold our leaders accountable to what they say? It's great to have this great uh, 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 vision, and we're delighted the leaders have this. How can we ensure accountability? I need to ensure accountability. We need to have a mechanism to monitor the values. We need to be able to remind them that in Nakoto they came with targets, and most of them have not met those targets. They are coming up with a new one, a new set of goals in Malabar, and we hope this time they will implement it, but not leave it there. I think the civil society and the population must monitor must monitor and make their views uh, uh, And one of those who firmly believes that if leaders fail to lead, the people can make them follow. And, and, and I think if the people are organized and realize that they are, and monitor these things and question the leaders, and they know that they are going to be questioned, and the people they use it are the next generation. Their attitude will be different, and I don't think we even have to ask them to implement before they come back to report that we made these promises and this is what we have. So we are also 50% responsible. 50% of the responsibility belongs to the leaders and those who made the commitments, and only promises which are implemented are promises which are. But the 50% depends on us. Individuals and the population. We cannot sit on our hands and say we don't know what's going on. We don't understand what our leader is doing and leaving there. We have to make ourselves a key. Promises that are implemented are only the promises that are kept. Mr. Anand, you interact with politicians a lot. And how about if we were to develop something like a poverty accountability? that we are able to measure the performance of leaders in terms of poverty, nutrition, and all of those when they come into office, like in the, at the district level. And then that maybe about four years later, one can measure that. And then produce a poverty accountability index that we can give to the people you just mentioned. With. And then run politicians, if you could, based on their effectiveness. Will that help? Will that make people more aware and, and, and accountable to their constituents? It's an interesting idea, but it will be very difficult to get into the data and really uh, come up. But we need some sort of measurement. And when you indicate that you look at the reality at the beginning of your term and then produce a report four years later, you are fixing into the part cycle. First of all, these politicians, you vote for them. Those in this room uh, excluded. <laughs> <laughs> you vote for them, and the only time you see them again is four years later when they come to ask for your vote. So, if you're going to have a monetary system that will have an income, it has to be much more frequent than once every four years. Uh, ideally, you should do one every two years and get them to explain uh, what they have done. 
Pedro, what do you think? Well, I, I think this is a this is a great idea. But the same accountability should go for farmers, should go for scientists, should go should go for them, should go for uh, for all of us. Uh, I don't think my salary should be uh, measured uh, by the usual academic measures. Maybe it should be measured better by how many people that I help. And the same goes for everyone. We are all accountable. We're absolutely. Thank you. Mr. Allen, we have a problem of aging, a rapidly aging population of farmers in Africa today. Uh, about the average age in many countries, about 60. And the kind of ambition you give us to. He said, I have five sons. All of them have already left me. I'm going to the city where the lights are bright. I'm not sure how I'll be able to keep my best son with me. And if he doesn't stay, what happens to the farm? What happens to our production? I think we need to make farming and agriculture sexy. We need to get a younger. Come on, come on, Margaret, and that. Yeah. Yeah. We need to get the young people to demonstrate to them that they can make a genuine living, a good living in agriculture. But we also need to train, we need to prepare, we produce lots of university graduates, and we tell the world we have X number of graduates in China. They are going to come to the work market, work the market. But we cannot say what we prepare them for. And they don't know what they will prepare for. And we really have to focus on meaningful training for these young people, whether in agriculture or elsewhere. Prepare them for a life outside the university walls so that when they leave the university and they don't get jobs and they have skills, they can set up their own companies, they can come together and do their work. But is that training? And it doesn't always have to be at the investment level. Vocational training is involved. I was talking to African farmers, serious farmers, and they said we can't find farm managers. We have lots of jobs. How do we prepare them to take on these? And so, yes, we should encourage them, but we should give them the skills and the possibilities to let them do that. So, training and preparation is extremely important. Training and preparation. I think I want to recognize that. Uh, Two people are really doing way more than that. Uh, can I remind the president of IFA uh, went to IITA and inspired them all to do, uh, you know, get young people into agriculture. And I think IITA is doing a fantastic job in that. And so there's a lot of people already actually doing this. And thank you very much, Mr. Man. Now let's let's get to uh, an issue of private sector. You, Pedro, you will remember, when was it? Which year was Mr. Anand in Davos for the private sector discussion? January 2007. What happened? Tell what us. happened? Uh, Mr. Anand actually invited both of us to Davos, froze to death there. Uh, we, uh, we actually had to stay in a makeshift hospital. Uh, and, and, but nevertheless. But well, we were not sick, we just. No, no, it was no It was no place. It was very, very cool. I just came from studying us. Anyway, uh, what Mr. Anand did was he called the champions of, of the CEOs. First time. And for the first time, we saw that the private sector was going to get in the act. Going to get in the act along with the other uh, uh, sectors that are already working, such as governments, such as donors, such as NGOs, such as scientists, and so on. And it, it did happen there. It didn't happen right away. The private sector is actually very sharp and somewhat slow. In, in making decisions, but when, when they make it, then they make it. But to me, this has been uh, perhaps the, the one, of the, one of the big things about, about this green revolution. At the beginning, we didn't have it. Now they're there, we are together there, we're together here. We have a lot of good partnerships across the value chain, so one of those chains gets broken, uh, we try to fix it together. Good. I feel the private sector is the engine is going to do the scaling up of most of the while governments 
will enable uh, of course regulate and build infrastructure and so on. You know, this is a private sector business. Yes, I think we, uh, I would say that it's um, yes. It's, uh, it's government enabled private sector land transformation. Mr. Annette, how, how, what do you see? What must governments do differently to be able to get the private sector talking? Even over the now that I have, I saw you walking the room and getting the person doing a tractor, is it ARCO? Yeah. To, to be yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, so that's what Mr. Annette does best. So, how can we get the private sector to do the right thing for us now? First of all, the, the governments and all of us have to realize that governments cannot do everything. And in fact, uh, in some of our countries, they are doing far too much. It is difficult enough to govern the country. And you don't have to get a soup, you don't have to get a soup, you don't have to get run parks, leave others there uh, to do it. What they need to do is to create the right environment that would encourage the private sector, their own citizens, and release the entrepreneurial skills to develop their country, whether it's agriculture, whether it's manufacturing, or whatever. It is not the business of government to get into some of these uh, areas. The main claim that at the beginning of the, when we gained independence, there was nothing there, and they had to step in. 50 years on, be justified. 50 years on, what we need to do is to create the right environment that will attract investors, both local and international. Because we tend to forget is that the local investor needs the same sort of conditions as the external investor to, to invest and do their work. Uh, if the governments can discuss with their people, with private sector, and set up that sort of framework for the environment, I think we can see real changes in the economic And I know there's quite a lot of good things going on, so if I might just ask, we're only here for a few minutes, so please, let's not have conversations going on beyond, beyond this conversation. I would like everybody to pay attention to what is being said here, please. Mr. Annan, you, 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 on, on this issue, I just want to ask you, you, you told me one thing in New York. You said when your largest importer becomes your largest producer, then you make a shift. And we just got an equal and got it to put in a billion dollars into rice. What do you think? That's fantastic uh, to have uh, an African businessman putting a billion dollars into agriculture. Uh, this is in a country where I think you import about eight million, eight billion dollars worth of rice. Oh, it's about uh, three, three point five. Three point five. Okay, three point five billion dollars worth of rice. And if your importers realize that the future is in production, and that a time will come when they lose the easy money they make through imports, and that they have to invest in farms, they have to create jobs and they have to develop their country, then you really turn the corner. Because honestly, some of the problems we have in Africa is people would much rather import than have a grow and harvest. Because they find it easy. In fact, sometimes teas, I said, uh, we have a different definition of project implementation. If the officer dealing with the project decides he wants 5% of the project, when he gets that 5% it's completed, regardless of state, then he moves on to the next one. And we really have serious problems. But uh, if, if we have a, a, a situation where you are taking the long route, developing crops, producing and selling locally, you're really beginning to develop your country. Are you great jobs? And, and you're taking the long term view, you're creating job. And that's what we should encourage. Thank you very much. <laughs> but as we do that and we produce more, there's a lot of habits. But the reality Pedro, is that we lose a lot of it. About forty five percent of what we produce is what we lose. And what can we do in reducing that? 
conserving the carbs. Well, first, that's a low-hanging fruit. Because you have, you have already spent all the input, all the labor in getting, in getting the crop. And then you lose a horrible amount, as, as you say. Well, there are two, two things uh, that, that can be done that we know how to do. Uh, we have the technology. Uh, one of them is to harvest on time, not too early, and, and to store the grain or whatever uh, in low, in, in places where the insects are not going to chew But unfortunately, a few years ago in East Africa, a new insect came in. Technically, it's called a large grain border, but all the farmers I met across the region, they call him Osama. You mean Osama? Osama bin Laden. <laughs> they were, they were, they, this thing was so, uh, so horrible, to chew up the back of maize and just destroy it. Well, this Osama has been actually asphyxiated by hermetic bags that you, you close them, uh, the, poor, uh, the poor insects are running out of oxygen and they are asphyxiated. So there's, uh, it could be a bad, or it could be a large cocoon in soil. The other major problem we have is aflatoxin. Aflatoxin is, uh, is, is toxic to us and will stop any exportation, let's say, for the, uh, <coughs> uh, to the European Union or something. But IIPA has come up with an aflatex, a technology that will take care yeah, of the aflatoxin. I think that's it. The, the aflatoxin. Yeah. 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 And uh, so, therefore, there are the technologies here. And we can reduce a 45% loss to something like a 20% loss in the next five years. We're going to be multiplying food production without spending an additional dollar or beer in, in, uh, in growing food. Justin, I have a challenge. I can't read my notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm going to go ahead and ask anyway. Uh, Mr. Allen, you have been always talking about the importance of markets, uh, global markets, regional markets. Uh, I think the fact of the matter in Africa today is that only 12% of our trade is, uh, is being done among ourselves. And on global trade, despite what everybody says about Africa, the share of Africa in global trade increased from 2.5% in 2005 to 3.1% in 2011. So nothing really shifted. So what must be done to improve Africa's share of, of global trade and also regional trade? I would want to start uh, with, with regional trade. I don't know if I should refer to it as a global hunger fruit, but we really should be able to trade more amongst ourselves. I mean, you can get into a situation where you have surplus, let's say, in Tanzania on the border, you have surplus on one side, shortage on the other, and go across and sell. As you said, the produce will spoil on your hands. And Africa needs to develop the infrastructure necessary for us to trade amongst ourselves. The impediments we place in each other's way. The amount of time Africans spend at customs just to cross, uh, to take goods out. The amount of money we demand from landlocked countries is extra result uh, to really move goods around. If we were able to do that, we would be moving somewhere along. When it comes to the international scene, I think uh, I have always maintained that governments should remove the subsidies, the impediments they are placing the way of imports. And that, uh, I mean, we, there used to be a joke that the European Union uh, pays every farm enough subsidies to get every cow in Europe to travel around the world first of us. And have some <laughs> and, and this, and this is the competition uh, we have. So the subsidies has, has to be tight. In fairness, also, we need to look at the standards. We need to look at standards on our side. And there are genuine questions about standards regarding export. Sometimes it can also be manipulated, but in our own interest and for the health of our own people, standards 
you must be very instructive. And the standards we require for export, it's not only for us here. Exactly. Thank you very much, Mr. Pedro, as we bring this to a close, you've been talking about this for quite some time. You started as a food soldier in those days as the first student of the What's your vision of what this revolution would be? What's, give, me, give me a sense of your, let me say, your sense of success. What would success look like? Well, success is beginning to look now good. There is momentum. And we have to see it here. We see, we see the, the composition of different people, the momentum, the excitement, that yes, agriculture is sexy. Yes, agriculture is cool. And especially young people. Yeah. Yeah. Take, take this one. You did a bow tie. I did a bow tie. Oh, okay. I did a bow tie. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm looking for my wife here. And the next time, you better take me there. Get some bow ties. But, uh, but this is this is this is the vision. The vision is very simple. Africa, as Mr. Hernandez says, is a rich country, but it's full of it's full of poor people. And now things are changing. The, the macroeconomics are fantastic. Highest GDPs in the world are in Africa. Africa is moving. Africa is better governed. We have better, 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 better presidents and prime ministers than before. And now it is the time to hit it hard. So let's let's increase the production. Let's work across the value chain. So you don't get into into disasters like you have a bumper crop. I have no place to sell. Uh, let's move on nutrition. Uh, we need the nutrition revolution. We need you. And the evidence is there. The farmers are, are, are feeding, are, are producing vegetables and high protein and high value uh, produce. Uh, the kids uh, certainly look better. And, and stunting can be a thing of the past. The mission of Africa is one of a large, peaceful, happy country. Because Africans are basically happy people and, and without uh, and, and taking their place in the danger world. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pedro, for your remarks on, on that. I would want to see uh, a situation where we are investing seriously in where we are raising production. As I said, we have a double production in five years. Create an environment that encourages young people to go into farming. Take our farmers seriously and respect them. Farmers are smart. They are not as dumb as some of our city foods. Uh, think. I have engaged some of them and uh, even on climate change, they are ahead of us, some of us in, in, in the city. So I would want to see an Africa that is feeding itself, an Africa that has turned agriculture into serious business, and the subsistence farms have become small businesses, and small farmers working with large farmers are also helping feed uh, the world. And we want to see a situation where in almost every country, where you have fertile land, we have farm belts, red basket areas, where you focus production. We cannot pretend every region of the country can be an agricultural belt and, and really organize ourselves in a way that uh, we feed ourselves and create lots of employment and ensure that our farmers get a fair price for their produce. There are many situations where they are not good. Uh, it can be cocoa, it can be something else, but they really need to get the, the right amount uh, and incentives to be able to produce. So, I'm still dreaming big, Africa feeding itself, and in 10 years time, beginning to feed the rest of, of, of the world. And it can be done. So let's accept the challenge and move on with it. I know that you've just given us a great chance.
recharge their energy in the room. But you have seen so many things come and go with your uh, global leadership. You are a reservoir of wisdom. So tell us frankly, what are the big faults we must avoid so that we can achieve the vision of this country? I think one, one of the first and major pitfalls we should avoid is uh, uh, not sustaining the effort. Because we often launch big initiatives, big efforts, we make big speeches. And sometimes I get the impression that once we've made a speech, we think it's implemented. But, <laughs> but we should. We, we should really sustain the effort, and we should offer the farmers the support and the incentive that uh, they need, otherwise we would lose our, our weight. We should also look at uh, our local markets, what we can develop locally, expand the local market. Africa is urbanizing very fast, and we have lots of people to feed in these urban areas. Uh, we shouldn't sit back and say we cannot do this because we are not as hot. We have a huge market in Tenen that we haven't uh, exploited and we should really uh, look, look at that. The other thing that uh, worries me and, uh, and here as individuals and citizens, we can't play a role. We have to avoid the situation where African countries do not have a clear on vision you have situations where the government comes in, puts in lots of effort, pushes agriculture forward. Everybody is satisfied. A new government comes in and takes us in another direction and drops agriculture. And we, we really should avoid that. We have to have a consensus that this is what we want to do. Agriculture will give us a broad base of development. And regardless of who wins the elections, we are moving that direction. The zigzag which has happened in Africa places us in a situation where we are almost always starting from Africa and we need to avoid that. And, and if need be, we should have serious public debate and public policies on the direction and statement. Otherwise we may lose our way there again. And this time we will have nobody to blame.